Hey everybody, welcome to an episode of Handle the Heat. I am your host, TK, and with me today is radio personality, Nick Gammon. Nick, welcome to the show. <laughs> Nick Gammon. Nick Hammon. Why would I say that? Because we're about to eat wings, which are chicken. Gammon is a type of meat. I think you've reassociated. You've done well. It's a good start. How are you doing? Nice to see you. <laughs> it's good. Thank you that we don't have to cut this. You actually made it quite smooth. That's how we know you're a really good radio presenter. How long, you, how long have you been doing this for? I got into radio in 2011. Yeah. Uh, long story, relatively short, what happened is I was studying investment management at Stellenbosch University, which I hated. And one day I woke up and I realized that all the passions that I had in life were gone. Yeah. I wasn't doing anything that I loved to do at school. I wasn't doing music. I wasn't doing drama. I wasn't doing debating. I wasn't creatively involving myself with the world. Yeah. And so I saw an advert for a student radio station. I went, I signed up. Fast forward now to 2019. That was in... 2011, I, I got my first graveyard shift there from mm. 3 to 6 in the morning and, and cut my teeth, I suppose. Yeah. Well, let's get to the reason why we're here. It's a hot wings challenge. Yes. How are you with spicy food? I'm gonna, I don't know if it's good to say that I'm great, because normally if I go to a restaurant, I'll say to them, let's crank it all the way up. I'm going to say I'm great um, s- semi-cautiously, because you've been warning me that this is hotter than average. Yeah. People walk out crying. Um, so I hope you can handle this. For the record, you are the first white guy. On Amazing. The show. Okay, so I've got something to prove. Yeah. <laughs> huh? All prove. my fellow whites out there, I'm doing this for you. <laughs> you ready? Yeah, sure. The first thing. So good hope everyone finds you in Cape Town. Right. You're kidding the game. People love you, they love your skill, this came naturally. And on top of that, you are a secret jazz musician. You, you like, I don't know if you qualified or you just, I don't know how you, yeah. how yeah. did that find you? Because radio is more communication and so, jazz is music. Yeah, so when I was growing up, I was about maybe 11 years old, I think my dad had somewhat of a midlife crisis. I mean, he was a drummer when he was a kid and he hadn't played for like 25 years. Mm-hmm. And he decided one day he's gonna get himself a drum kit, he's gonna learn how to play again. The day that he bought it back, I was like, I'm getting into this. So I started playing when I was 11, 12 years old. And my dad, who'd been a jazz musician back in his day, he sort of became my first teacher. Mm. So the kind of stuff that I was listening to was like your early 40s, 50s, 60s, even jazz type music, because that's what he loved. And that's what I learned to play initially. Mm. And throughout my childhood, it became like a big bonding thing, him and I going to jazz clubs, learning to play. Um, and then through my schooling career, uh, a lot of doors just opened up in that world. So I ended up taking it more and more seriously. And I ended up going to a place called Beausoleil, which is like a, it's a school just for music that you attend after school. And that's where it gets pretty serious. You do like all your grades and you perform in big bands and you go to the Gramstown Jazz Festival and all that kind of stuff. And I just fell in love with the medium. It's still my favorite genre of music. So it's always something that's existed in my life concurrently with radio and everything else yeah. that I've done. You've actually, we had a conversation at the Summer Awards and you said, you said this one thing that, that stuck on me. You said, people who, have, people who make music to get on radio are making a product and they're not making art. Yes. You want to like expound on that? Yeah, absolutely. Actually, um, I used to do a column for Huffington Post and I, I wrote about this kind of thing a lot. I generally think that radio is not a platform that exists to find the latest in new music. Radio is a platform that mines commodities so as that an audience can enjoy said commodity, right? So if you're making music for radio, you're making music that, uh, th- that a company that's trying to make something that already fits into a mold wants. Mm. You're not trying to do something that's inherently creative for creative sake. Mm. That's not to say, by the way, that radio doesn't play good music. I think it does. I like pop music and I like the kind of things that society goes, this is cool. But I just think... If you're trying to make a copy of what already exists, you're, that's not the artistic process. An artist should sit with a, a blank slate and say, what is the best thing that I can possibly do? Despite, it doesn't matter who likes it. it doesn't, if, you, if you're making music for radio, you're making music for business, not for anything else. There's a really good song by a guy called Tech Nine, mm. called Sriracha. And it features Joyner Lucas, who's an amazing rapper. Mm-hmm. And Logic on the song as well. And for the longest time, I didn't like Logic because I thought he had like, he's got a terrible verse on that song. It's really bad. 
And I find it so disrespectful because Tech Mind's like an OG. So you get this once in a lifetime shot to be on a song with him mm. and you screw it up. You do a really yeah, bad yeah. verse. And it wasn't until he released Homicide Now with Eminem that I've actually come to like Logic again, just by the way. Do you find it hard to um, blow a song up, speak positively about it, but deep down you know, this is not a good song. This is a trash song. I don't, I don't do that. I will, if, if, if I like a song, I will say I like a song. If I don't like a song, I acknowledge that other people like it and um, that it's there for a reason, but I won't, won't say anything about it. So, but when it comes to radio, how often are there smoke and mirrors where, I mean, we've, we, for example, we see a lot, of, <coughs> hear a lot of songs that get played on repeat. Already? <laughs> There's a bit of a kick on that, yeah. We hear a lot of songs that get played on repeat. And most presenters will say yes, that was whoever they'll present the song and it will seem like everyone likes it. Is, it, is that who decides what should, what should be played on rotation? So most, most radio stations have got a, <clears throat> it's not the heat, it's the way that I edge it. <laughs> I just keep talking like this. <clears throat> wow. Okay. Most of the radio stations have music playlist committees. Those are like internal bodies that, are pe- I, I've worked with one for a long time. There are groups of bodies of people that get together and based on information they get from like, overseas and marketing research that gets done and their own personal taste they pick songs for the station so most DJs don't actually playlist music themselves they're not sitting there picking the songs as they go yeah. I'm in a bit of a different bone because I do a lot of local stuff that isn't on the rest of the station but that's because something that's been really important to me for a long time so I've fought for that sort of space but the other side of it is when you're on radio you don't really get too bored because the music is, when the music is playing, like that's the time that you're doing everything else you need to do. Yeah. You're getting the callers on the air for a game you're playing, you're setting up an interview, you're thinking through a creative concept, how you want to speak about something. So even if it's the 40th time in the month you're hearing Justin Bieber, you're not really listening to it. You know what I mean? You're, you're creating the radio, you're not consuming it, if that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So I like what you said, but you said you, pro- you like to promote local stuff and that's been a mission for you. Yeah. Um, with that being said, Paola, is that a real thing? Yeah, I think it definitely is a real thing. I think it exists. I mean, I will state unequivocally that I've never been involved with it, nor have I actually ever had, I've never had anyone approach me about it. Um, but I know that investigations have happened that are public knowledge all over the place where, where it, it has happened. Corruption pollutes. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a devastating thing in any industry. Um, it just hurts me more in, because it's involved with creativity. I think that really sucks. Yeah. Um, you know, I've heard stories where people, they get almost unknowns, get their songs put onto hot rotation on stations because they're willing to pay the right kind of person money. But what I do think as well is that the more and more that stations grow and develop, the harder it gets to do. Like, I, I legitimately believe that even if you wanted to, and you say you and I were working together, we wouldn't be able to get a song on 5FM because it's not just me. You come to me, I say, cool, I've still got to convince like 10, 15 other people that this is a good idea. Mm-hmm. On top of that, we've got an audience that's pretty switched on. So if the song wasn't good enough to be on radio, the tweets are going to start. The tweets are going to start, the voice notes are going to start coming in, people are going to start commenting, people are going to write letters, eventually investigation is going to be held and everything's going to come out. So at an established station like the one I work at, I don't think it's possible and I think the more that other stations get to that point, the less it will happen, hopefully. So from Good Hope FM to Five, right? You step into the you step into a room where there's legends of shoes to fill in from Mark Gilman, Sasha Martiningo, Roger Good. What what's the pressure like? What's what was the pressure like? What's the pressure like now? And what was the pressure like before when you stepped in? Like this is a whole new space for you. Because you moved from Cape Town to Joburg anyway. So different different community. Yeah, and bear in mind I was, I was 23 years old at the time. Yeah. I was still in university. And the guy whose show I kind of stepped into, I was a massive fan of for my entire life. So I felt this huge personal responsibility to do a good job. Um, the difference that I had is I think I'm part of the first generation that does kick late. Yeah. Wow. Goodness me. Yeah, I'm part of the first generation that came in with social media. So normally if you get given a job somewhere and you realize that it's an intimidating task, you know that you need to put your head down and you need to do the best possible job that you can and you're only evaluated by your immediate peers and by your boss. I came in at 23 years old to this really intimidating task of speaking to an entire country of people and I did it in front of social media. So 
I was immediately opened up to the thoughts of people who legitimately were upset by the fact that the dude who they'd grown up listening to, just like I did, one day is suddenly not there, and you've got to direct that anger somewhere. You're going to direct it at the guy that's taken that person's job, for lack of a better way of putting it, because that's not what happens, but that's how the public sees it. So in the beginning, I remember getting like vile, vile messages sent my way on social media, some pretty funny stuff as well. I'd get tweets saying like, yo, Nick Hammond, when you walk into, when you're trying to cross the road later today and a car hits you, that's not going to be an accident, dude. Like stuff like that. Um, and, a, and a lot, a lot of that. And when you're 23 years old and you're still developing as a human being, you know, that, that can be quite intimidating and overwhelming. And there's also, because it was a new world, there's no one to really talk you through it. Yeah. But we got through it. And after about sort of six months to a year, things started turning around year in, two years in, three years in, now we're at a point where the show is just, it's been consistently growing and, yeah. and um, we've kind of won people over. And I think I'm grateful that I went through the beginning. Is social media somehow killing the art of doing radio? Um, we're, seeing, we're seeing now more now more than often, social media accounts are hired to be radio DJs versus, versus people who went to go do training or courses or whatever they needed to do to, be, to enter the game. What's so your take on that? My, my take is this. A person who has come up is not radio, has no business being on radio. If you're famous because you're an actress or because you're popping on social media or anything, you have no business being on radio. And I say that because radio is a very particular art form. The same way that being a social media influencer is a very particular art form. There's a style, there's a, there's a way that it's done. There's things that are, are taught, that are shared. Um, it's, a, it's, it's an art form and it's a discipline. And you notice it more and more. Yeah. When people are on radio that are not radio people, you can tell. Yeah. The thing is, everyone's metrics are different. Mm. So even within the social media space, there's some people that are like crazy big on Twitter, but they've got like 100 Instagram followers or vice versa yeah. or YouTube or TikTok or one of these newer apps. Or maybe they're really big on TV, but they're small on radio. You know, th these, these things happen across the board. And I think rather be really good at what you do, stick to it and you'll do a good job. But... So that, that's the one side of it. I, I think people that aren't radio trained don't have a business being in radio. Um, the other side of it, though, is that I do think that traditional media should be excited by the way that the world is changing. The fact that the 10 people on a radio station now are not the only 10 people we're forced to engage with. The fact that anybody can get a few cameras, record on a cell phone, can create content, and we get more voices thrown into the mix, I think that's brilliant. And I think that should scare radio. I think that that should make radio go and say, okay, cool, how do we pull up our socks? Because a lot of content on the radio is, is in my opinion, quite lazy these days. So when you're not on radio, you're writing, you're traveling, tell us about the book you're writing. Mm. I'd love to. Let me just have a sip of milk quickly. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, I've done, I've done quite a bit of writing over the years. Um, I used to write more poetry when I was younger uh, and got a few things published and like anthologies and stuff like that. And it, it's always been something that I've, I've enjoyed doing. Um, I was a columnist for a while for a bunch of different publications. I, write, I used to write for the Huffington Post. Um, and I've had this dream to write a book for the longest time. And you know, when you start to get older in life, you have to really ask yourself, like, what, what of all the hundreds of thousands of things that you've said you're going to do, what are you actually going to do? I'm going to make a movie at some point. I'm going to write a TV show. I'm going to write a book. And I started evaluating those things. And at the top of that list for me was, you're going to write a book. So I can't say, I can tell you what the book's about. I can't tell you too much about the publishing deal and stuff like that. We're still workshopping it around and it's going to a few different places. So, so where it will come out and how it will look remains to be seen. But basically, I've had this idea that a lot of people in life are not that honest with each other. And the, the only time that we really are honest with ourselves is when we're entirely alone. And I think that encouraging open conversations between people is a really great way to like open people up. Um, so what I've done for the book is I've isolated a bunch of people who live life on some kind of an extreme fringe. So maybe you've been sentenced to life in prison, or maybe you've, you're, you're facing a life-threatening illness that's going to take you out, or maybe, um, <clears throat> maybe you've, you used to be a criminal and now you, you live your life a different way, or maybe you try to commit suicide and you survived. These kind of people, I think, have really valuable lessons about life that the average person could stand to learn from. So what I do in the book is I start off by talking about my impression of what a person that has gone through something like that is without speaking to them. Yeah. And then I speak to them and I see how my perception changes. That's the, 
That's the book. Launch date, release date, talk to us. So, I, I, I said these things are complicated. You're working with publishers and and doing things, um, doing things. This is the, my first radio like this. Yeah. Um, but I would like to think that it's going to be out next year, September. We're waiting for you. Thank you. Yeah, please buy it. It's time for the vintage sauce. This means it's not as hot. Hey, we're taking a step back now. <laughs> the show is disrespecting my, my mouth. This is, yeah, this is really good. And I'm less and less hungry with every bite, which is great. As a travel enthusiast, what are the best places in Africa and South Africa you've been to where you can experience the best? And what places are you like comfy, pre comfortably prepared to trash and go? You guys need to up, up, upgrade your food. Upgrade your food. So, I'll talk about South Africa specifically. The best places to get food in South Africa are not the fanciest places. There's some beautiful, really good fine dining restaurants that I would never select because good friends of mine um, have some, have opened, wow, this is hard to do. <laughs> have opened some really beautiful places, you know, restaurants like, people like David Higg, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant chef. But there's a lot of these places you'll go to in your fancy areas in Johannesburg that just cannot go toe to toe with authentic cuisine. An example that I, <coughs> example I, <coughs> wow, an example that I'll make is this. So there's a lot of different migrant communities that live and exist in South Africa, right? For example, there's a Chinese community that largely centers itself around Cyril Dean in the Johannesburg area and has since after apartheid. If you go to Cyril Dean and you eat at the Chinese restaurants there and you pay a fraction of the price of what you would anywhere in sort of Sandton or the wealthy areas, you're going to eat real Chinese food, better Chinese food. Same thing, if you go to Fordsburg, you're going to eat better curry, better Indian food, better you know, Islamic food, um, then you're going to find at fancier places that are in far more wealthier areas because they're made by people that actually come from these communities. And I think across the board, that should be every South African's approach is to travel as much as possible. The best music venues in this country are in the heart of, you go to Shawelo in Soweto, in the middle of that place, there's a, there's a, there's a live music venue called Sabona Music Jam, which every Tuesday you're gonna hear the best music in the country. You pay 400 Rand, you go sit in a theater somewhere else, you're not gonna hear things as good. In order to experience the best, it's about attitude. To experience the best in this country, you have to be willing to go to where the communities are actually doing things. And if you're not, that's when, that's when you're going to find trashy stuff. You're quite good with this stuff, huh? I try. So Nick Hammond, thank you for coming to the show. Mm. It was basically Hammond time. Yeah, thank you for having me. Thank you for feeding me. As you enjoy this last wing, who would you like to challenge? To come on here? Tell them, yeah. Who would you like to challenge? What you're up to? What's your next projects? Where can we find you? So, you can find me on social media, Instagram at Nick Hammondgram, on Twitter at Nick underscore Hammond. I've just deleted my Facebook, so don't bother. Wait for the book. Um, and obviously, on Hammond Time, Monday to Fridays, 9 to 12 and 5 FM, an espresso show every Wednesday on Beats Uncovered, where I talk about the latest music, predominantly in the local, but also international music industry. Who needs to be here? Do you know who I honestly would love to see here is an, um, somebody that I worked with you or with at the Psalmers. I know Robert Boy's already been here, watched his episode, but Candice, Candice Morissette. I would oh, love, yeah? yeah, if you could get her to come and eat hot wings and I could just maybe be here hanging around, I would enjoy that. Yeah.